of what it means to have a sense of connection to and of our place in the world that is not scientific. You know, we're aware of cosmological, astronomical, physical, chemical, biochemical, evolution, sociology, psychology, all you know, wonderful stuff that does ground us in our reality. But that's not all of it. There is a part of it that is very subjective, personal, individual, and one might say philosophical, or within philosophy, they've got this phenomenology, definitely, you know, worth looking into a little bit. Uh, and that's what distinguishes our church from most all the other churches in town. We believe in God, but in the same way that we believe in James Bond. Hey, the movie's just turned 50 this week. You hear that on the news? Uh, or the same way we believe in Superman or Spider-Man or Wonder Woman. Idealized versions of uh, people. So God is an idea. It's an interesting thought experiment. And that's why most atheists, in fact, take issue with the supposedly all-good being who carries out and orders genocide. Most, it's the atheists, really, that are sort of upset about those kinds of stories in the Old Testament. And you know, we can often hear ourselves, oh, how did that happen? Because we're holding God to a standard of, of this thought experiment. We also don't consider that God is a good lens to view the world through. The idea of an all-powerful, all-knowing, and completely beneficent being is, it's an idea, maybe an impossible idea, like a perpetual motion machine. But there are many ideas, many ways to exercise our wide-ranging imaginations and aspirations. I don't think it's any accident that so many of us freethinkers are fans of science fiction. So that's what the Church of Free Thought uh, is. Religion without the superstition, Religion free of the requirement to believe things, but accepting of and embracing the responsibility of thinking. It is, to borrow the terminology of Wilfred Cantwell Smith, being religious while rejecting the very concept of religion as most people now understand it. So we're in the vanguard. That's one way of looking at it, even according to uh, theologians, uh, people who study that like Smith. Among other things, of course, what this translates into practical terms is that we celebrate doubt, not faith. Because you can't think about something if you're committed to believing in a bunch of doctrines about it. So here's our creed. So our creed after fashion, working to understand and live by the rule of reason, enjoying fellowship, sharing our rational outlook, learning from each other, which uh, we hope we do every Sunday and first Sunday of the month here, serving something larger than our own egos, caring and helping others through life passages. And we got some kids next door too, I think, that enable you guys to talk to your kids. Often we have more kids, and it's important that they uh, like this idea of thinking for yourself also. And finally, just demonstrating that the rule of reason and a love for this one life we know is sufficient. Well, next month we have uh, another service course, and it will be the month that we're Thanksgiving falls. So each year we kind of talk a little bit about the being grateful as a way of being good. Uh, yeah, the Kippur happened recently, too. You know, there is something that the Christians don't make much of as a sort of atonement. The idea is supposed to be, you know, if you go to people that you've offended and get forgiven, not, not from God, just set things right in your life. Um, so I think Thanksgiving can be a little bit of like that. Um, please go to our website. We're going to put some things on there that, uh, well, in fact, there's forums, too. I put some jokes in there. If you know any other religion jokes, go and post them. Those are always fun. Uh, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on this thing called AtheistNexus.org. And of course we're having lunch afterwards today, so great time to uh, talk to each other about all the things that have been happening. Uh, it's five weeks since the last service, uh, usually it's four. Uh, David Fitzgerald, uh, remember last time I told you that uh, Greg Christina was coming to town, but her dad died, so that got canceled. Now we got this David Fitzgerald, who's a professor at a California college. He's written this book called Mail. 10 Christian myths that show Jesus never existed at all. He's going to be at SMU, UTA, and UTD. There are some nominal admission charges, I think, for the last two. I don't think for SMU is what it looked like, but we'll put the information and the details on the website uh, in there. So, um, Melissa and Albert, they're usually here. They're not here because they got married yesterday. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah we, went out, we went out to the J right. Isn't that great? Yeah, so we'll see them again. They'll be, they'll be coming back. But they've been together for seven years, and they decided to go ahead and get married. I, Albert looks like, uh, he's trying to look like a movie poster guy. Right? <laughs> That's, this is off their We're Getting Married website. All right, so today we have a moment of science. Uh, uh, West Nile virus has been in the news and so forth, and uh, I thought, well, let me check this out. And think, there's probably more to it than what the uh, media is reporting. And I just found out yesterday that Merlin here spent six days in the hospital from 
West Nile virus. So uh, if you want to talk to them about what it's like to have West Nile virus, and you can say you know somebody who got it. At any rate, uh, West Nile virus was discovered in Uganda in 1937. Uh, in the mid-1990s, there were outbreaks of the disease in Algeria and Romania, with many cases of encephalitis. You hear this word encephalitis, meaning infection of the brain. It was first found in the Americas in Queens, New York City, 1999. So it's been here less than 10 years. And has spread throughout the Western Hemisphere since then. The virus is also a problem in Europe, the Middle East, and Australia. The CDC, Centers for Disease Control, states that since its appearance in the U.S., there have been about 30,000 known cases in humans, uh, with over 1,000 deaths. 2012 has been the worst year yet, with about 3,500 cases, probably lots of ones that have not diagnosed, and so far about 147 deaths. You know, it keeps going up, so might be more, a little more than that now. Almost half of these 147 deaths in the U.S. have been in Texas, half of them. And uh, about half of those have been in Dallas and Tarrant County, so we're like the epicenter of this thing. This is 10 times the average number of fatalities from this disease over the last five years. Now, this shows the distribution of West Nile virus by year in the Western Hemisphere. So you see the yellow starting off in New York and then spreading, and uh, even in 2004, 2005, being in South America. How in the world does that happen? See if you can guess, because you'll get the answer in a minute. Here's a worldwide spread. But uh, look how you know, just northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, boom, boom, it's all over the place. Well, West Nile virus is a single-stranded RNA virus, like HIV, the AIDS uh, virus. But it belongs to a different family of such viruses known as the Flaviviridae. Flava in Latin means yellow, and this family of viruses includes yellow fever and other nasty diseases like dengue. And by the way, yellow fever is called that not because people turn yellow and jaundice when they get it, but because, at least this is what it says some places, maybe, they, maybe it was called that, but they would put up yellow flags on the uh, ships or other locations where they had yellow fever disease. Uh, genetic studies of the West Nile virus, oh, you know that terrible Darwinism thing? And you know we're told by experts, of course, that that Darwinism is just collapsing. You know, it's scientifically being disproven every day. Uh, but if you, if you use those studies, they've been able to determine that this virus emerged about a thousand years ago, and now exists as two main lineages. Well, West Nile virus is transmitted by mosquitoes, mainly from a reservoir of infected birds. Now think about birds. One thing a lot of them do is they're migratory. <coughs> So they can carry this virus far and wide. Robins are a particularly important host to the virus, and robins flourish in urban, suburban, and agricultural areas, so-called human-modified environments. So that's uh, another part of this whole business. Uh, the robin population, which had been growing, is now leveled off, and uh, another avian host, crows, their populations have just crashed uh, as a result of West Nile. Uh, this virus also infects mammals and even amphibians. Uh, but they're dead end holes because they don't really amplify. In other words, if you get West Nile, the mosquito bites you, there's not enough virus around to reinfect the mosquito, so it's kept going by, by the bird hosts. Uh, the West Nile virus uh, infects lots of different kinds of animals. In 2007, here in Texas, a killer whale in San Antonio, and I would think this would be SeaWorld, died of West Nile and sun virus. Isn't that amazing? So, guy comes up to breathe, mosquito swoops in, oh my gosh. But except for birds, these are uh, these dead-end infections, like I said. Ooh, I don't want to show this very long because it's like horror movie, but it's just on Halloween month. So the usual vector of the virus is the southern house mosquito, this, this one here on the top. I was going to say this guy, but it's actually the gals who uh, bite. But since 1985, the Asian tiger mosquito um, has been widespread in uh, Texas and the rest of the, rest of the uh, southeastern United States. And that mosquito has also been found here in Texas to be carrying West Nile virus. The uh, Asian tiger mosquito, in fact, is kind of unusual because it's active during daylight hours. So this, you know, stay out and stay inside, gone to dust. That's not going to help you. This mosquito is active during the daytime. It's known to transmit over 22 different viruses, including yellow fever. You know, there used to be yellow fever epidemics in the United States back in the day. You know, Benjamin Rush and that stuff in the early 1800s. So. We could start seeing that again, too, I suppose. Um, this Asian tiger mosquito is also on the list of the world's 100 worst invasive species. The 
European counterpart of the CDC, the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, just issued guidelines for Europe for mosquito uh, surveillance of that continent. Part of it because of concerns over this insect, which I guess they import a lot of uh, tires, and uh, the tires hold water, and uh, the Asian tires just love to breed in there. Now, it's thought this is kind of a busy slide, but if you have good eyesight, you can see it. It's thought that up to 80% of people that uh, are infected with West Nile virus have no symptoms, and they recover on their own. Don't, don't even know it. It's people over 50, especially men, with chronic medical problems, especially if you have high blood pressure, diabetes. Uh, I guess that's kind of a chronic medical condition, being a guy. But <laughs> people with weakened immune systems, they're the most likely to become ill. Uh, you see here, uh, West Nile, uh, just uh, symptomatic, only 20%. You know, the 80% is missing here because those are the people who don't get symptoms. And then the West Nile neuroinvasive disease. See, you don't get that as often. But look at down here. You get uh, uh, this variety here where you get uh, encephalopathy, encephalitis. You get a 20% chance of dying. And uh, you start getting some paralysis, weakness, and so forth. Uh, and people even have trouble breathing who get this form of the disease. 10 to 50 percent chance of dying. So you're lucky. You, you made. You're lucky. I know that. Yeah. Um, just to put things in perspective, of course, uh, West Nile 147 people killed uh, so far this year. Influenza is usually estimated to kill 3,000 to 50,000. Although people who usually die of influenza, the influenza messes up their lungs and they get uh, ordinary pneumonia. HIV AIDS still 9,000 to 10,000 people dying from that every year. No specific treatment for West Nile virus if you get it and if you have symptoms. Antiretrovirals, remember I said it's an RNA virus, so you target the enzyme that converts from RNA to DNA. Uh, those are being studied. There is a vaccine for horses, but human vaccine is not expected for maybe as much as another five or ten, five to ten years. And one can only wonder whether sort of the anti-vaccine zealotry of uh, some folks will play into that. Uh, for now, the only measures available are anti-mosquito strategies and these uh, four Ds, they call it, DEET, or other insect repellent, dressing in long sleeves and pants, staying inside from dawn to dusk, but you know, we still have the Asian tigers, and drainage of standing water that offers breeding grounds for mosquitoes, and uh, old tires especially, and even swings, you know, people put up the tires for swings, but it rains so they get water in there. It only takes a few days for mosquitoes to lay their eggs and for the, uh, and then for them to hatch out and fly away. So our moment of science is usually uh, aimed, I don't know if you noticed that, it's a I look for, uh, for a picture on Dawn the Desk, it turns out there's a movie about vampire creatures and stuff called Dawn the Desk. <laughs> well, you know, mosquitoes are vampires, so okay. Uh, so our moment of science is usually aimed at revealing some larger life lessons, and the message here, of course, is pretty simple. Protect yourself. Yeah, Just yeah. as you do against HIV, yes? Did you just mention what a couple of the uh, symptoms are so you know you have? Yes, well, fever, muscle aches and pains, uh, but if you, if you get neurological kinds of things, it's going to be difficulty breathing, seeing double, right. uh, same as like when somebody has a stroke, dysarthria, where you're not speaking clearly. What, what were the symptoms that you got, Merlin, that uh, clued you into something that was really wrong? May I address you all? Thank you for your patience. My symptoms were very specific and dangerous. I couldn't drink water. I couldn't eat any food. And the first idea that I had it is I thought I had something like the flu. And that lasted about eight or 10 hours. And by Saturday morning, I was in deep trouble because I couldn't keep anything down. How mine uh, came about, that is the specific problem, was that the virus was attacking the blood vessels in the nerves. And my esophagus, my brain and my whole body has got a lot of nerves. So the esophagus froze up tight, swelled up so tight I couldn't get anything down. I was in the hospital for six days. They put me on steroids immediately to try to get the swelling down so they could get some food in me besides IVs. After the uh, IVs were on me for two days, I could finally take in some food. But in the six days that I was in the hospital, I lost 18 pounds for lack of nourishment. It's not a good way to lose weight, believe me. The other problem, there was a lot of individual problems, loss of coordination and uh, 
Yeah. You can't hardly feed yourself because you don't know what your hand is going to do because you're shaking so that way. That was a big problem. The other thing was that was very, very uh, annoying is every time I opened my eyes, you've got to remember that the blood vessels in the macula were also attacked and they swelled. And this was displayed by every time I opened my eyes, I had black dots, hundreds of them floating around. I could see people, but I couldn't concentrate on them because the black dots were all over the, the view of vision. It's quite annoying. Um, that's about it. Uh, you want to sleep a lot, by the way. I was sleeping 20, 22 hours a day. And very, very uh, thirsty. Couldn't get enough water. But especially the first couple of days, I couldn't ingest any water and throw it all back up. And so without water and without food, the body takes quite a beating, as you might think. Uh, you have a question. Were you able to talk? You know, can tell the doctor what was going yes. on? Yes. You were able to talk? That's, yeah. a big, that's at least one big plus. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, your mouth's full and then you cannot talk. That's right. You're you, you can't describe the problem. <laughs> yeah. 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 Fortunately, I was in the hospital. I recognized it right away and uh, sent away to get the lab check, make sure that it was not. It took them five days to get that little problem cleared up, but I had it nevertheless. Yeah, it's not a lab test that they do every day, so uh, probably is a sent out as they, as they call it. But we're so glad you made it, uh, Merlin. So. I hope you too. Your hands are So you got to back. Like I said, we're so glad you made it. Uh, and when I put together this material, I hadn't yet emailed Merlin to say, hey, I missed you last month, but we'll see you tomorrow, and he emails me back. I've been, I've been getting better from West now. Holy schmoly. Uh, but probably, we're, I mean, it's not like you're irresponsible in terms of going out and saying, hey, mosquitoes, uh, have a lunch or something. So did you even know you'd been bitten? The, the day that I was bitten, I know about the period that it happened. And at that particular time, I had long sleeve shirt on, gloves, a hat. The only thing that was open was probably my face and maybe my wrist. And I still got bit. Yeah. You were in the backyard you were doing your job, work or something? I was, outdoor? I was working. Yes. Uh -huh. I volunteered at a golf course and I was working at the golf course. But I still I had gloves on, long sleeves. I was covered was up. It, was it day or evening or? Yeah. Middle of the day, 10 to 2. Oh, okay, so that, that was that day. Tiger that got because here. my symptoms showed up 12 hours away. It took about 12 hours to intervene. Wow. Well, thanks for sharing us uh, with us, Merlin. Actually, there's a lot more interesting stuff I could have talked about, too. One of the things that sticks in my mind uh, also is that you know, normally there's a thing called the blood brain barrier. Our brain is uh, uh, really isolated from the rest of our body. There's no <coughs> drugs that if you have a brain infection, you, you can't. But they're not going to work unless you put them in the spinal fluid or something because the drugs can't penetrate that blood-brain barrier. But the West Nile virus does something that causes the molecules with which the cells hang on to each other to make those really tight junctions and create the blood-brain barrier to cause the destruction of those molecules and make the brain kind of permeable to, uh, to the virus. So it's pretty scary stuff, but it's, it's also very interesting that we've been able to figure these things out in a fairly short amount of time. And uh, maybe this would be a possibility for targeting with uh, medication. So anyway, so that's been our moment of science. Um, David Burgess, our music expert, music appreciation professor, couldn't be here today, but he did suggest that we give a listen to this short work by Russian composer Anatoly Konstantinovich Lyotov. Anybody heard of Lyotov before? I, it's not like Mozart, but uh, most of us. Anyways, he uh, uh, wrote this thing called Baba Yaga, Opus 56. The music goes with a Russian fairy tale in which two children are sent by their evil stepmother uh, to uh, a woman in the woods who is actually a witch, and they're helped in their escape by befriending animals that they've uh, given crumbs to and stuff like that. They've helped all little humble creatures and then they'll wind up being instrumental in saving their lives. Um, be before we go, too, I would just say that, of course, scary stories go way back. There are plenty of scary stories even in the Bible, but scary music, I talked to David about this. Music has this way of sort of creating this uh, feeling in you. And it seems like scary music really didn't come along until some of the religious superstitions started receding. So you just imagine playing scary music or singing scary music back in, oh, I don't know, the year 900 or something? And then people would probably freak out. <laughs> so, uh, anyways, let me get to that. Uh, the picture
picture, it's just the same picture all through here, it's not really a video, but it shows a picture of the little cottage that the children are sent to, which has chicken feet, among other things. So. Probably should have set the volume a little bit higher, John. Because we, you know, we're all kind of good sensitive ears. So. And I think the evil stepmother gets killed in the end, and uh, the, the, the father just raises his kids and they live happily ever after. But it's like probably a lot of fairy tales in 18 different versions. Yes? There is a piece of music. And it's written by Mendoza, you picked it on the expression? Oh, yes. Hot and foul life. That is really cool. That gets you. Isn't that something? Yeah, yeah. you got it. I, I play his music, too. Well, um, like music. the music appreciation aspect of things is um, always welcome, too. Now, this is about the Salem witch things, but uh, I want to advance it a little bit, because the first part is a, is a little corny. Uh, thing that's not very well done anyway, so let me just see if I can fix it. <laughs>
uh, in fact, the Salem will be 20 altogether. Uh, but uh, there's a number of works that have been done on witchcraft, rooting out witchcraft in Europe and these other places. Of course, no, no telling how many people in Africa where they, they believe in animism and so forth. So you don't have to be Christian to believe in that witchcraft stuff. It's supposed to be like 40 said, there's the hanging tree. They really went at it back in Salem in 1692. Okay, well, it's close enough. I'm a historian of American religious history, uh, Christianity, primarily in America. I teach all of that in various ways, but for the most part, I write about the 17th century here and, and also in England. So I'm a transatlantic historian. Witchcraft, of course, goes back to Exodus. There's a sentence, don't let a witch live. And then in late medieval Europe, it was revived, uh, really as a major issue. It was an issue in ancient Israel as well, which is why it's in the Old Testament. So the colonists were being perfectly ordinary, doing the ordinary, usual thing when they had their inquiries about who was a witch and who was not. Witchcraft is a primarily a legal process with a strong social base. So the social base is that in villages, towns, these are very small communities in early New England, people insult each other and insult them by calling that person a witch. I came to Salem um, and I spent about just about three weeks here and did a lot of research. And there were records, you know, that you can only read in Salem. So there were records of what were called the examinations, which were the pre-trial hearings, which uh, are very full. I mean, it's wonderful that we have all those records. The questions that are being asked by the magistrate and the answers to the which suspects were giving. And they actually made very dramatic reading. The magistrate is pressing Sarah Good. He's saying over and over again, do you not afflict these children? You see how they are afflicted. Have you not seen the devil? Have you not made a pact with the devil? And she kept saying, no, no. Then he said, how come these children are afflicted? And she says, there are others you brought here, too. Others are doing it. And you can just tell. I mean, she's grasping at straws. I mean, she doesn't, he will not believe her. So she tries to cast the blame on somebody else. Um, but then she did herself no good by that, because the assumption would be, if she knew who was afflicting the children, she must be a witch too. To most of us, the least understandable aspect of it is that 50 or so people said in court that they were witches. We call them the confessing witches. We say, why would someone confess who had not actually signed the devil's compact? Because none of these people, none of these people had lived signed the devil's compact. And the answer, the simplest answer would be a psychological, has to be a psychological answer, that they had absorbed the message that they were sinners, tempted. Now, there's one other legal aspect of this. None of the confessing witches were executed. To, to prove to the court that you actually were a confessing witch is that you're asked to name others. Well, the whole village had been fraught with dissension already, even before this happened. People were regarding each other with tremendous suspicion and enmity and fear and thinking, you know, um, that somebody they really disliked anyway might be a witch, or even if they weren't, you know, wouldn't it be good if they were named as a witch? because that could lead to their destruction. Spectral evidence came up in the sense that a, a woman or a man would testify to being tormented by someone who no one else could see, uh, and people could change form, or the devil could uh, insert himself in people and make them do bizarre things, but not, not legally a significant role until Salem. And that, of course, is the Achilles heel of the whole Salem process, the use of spectral evidence. It's fair to say all the girls, when it came to the examinations and trials, were shamming. They may have been genuinely hysterical before, they may have genuinely thought they were being the witch before, but when it came to the examinations and trials, they were putting on a show that they knew they had to put on, because otherwise they might start being accused of being witches themselves. Um, when it developed, it really was a political 
episode. I mean, it, okay, the way it started wasn't, but when it went on, it continued because of village politics and town politics, and in the end, was of Massachusetts Bay politics. That's what drove the whole episode on. Very early, there was the feeling that judicial errors were being made. But how hard it was to stop this thing, that's, that's, that was the problem. Who had the courage to stand up and say, this is really a train that's run off the tracks. October is the last uh, session of the court, and then the governor of Massachusetts suspends the court because he's, he's aware something is not going to correct. And then in January, the remaining prisoners are let loose. So it all, like, teetered to an end. I mean, there was no um, great statement from anybody saying this has all been the most dreadful mistake. We've executed 20 innocent people. What I hope people will learn is how witch hunts happen. We can learn to be aware if such a process seems to be starting in a community at any level. What it is about us that causes us to um, become fearful and suspicious and irrational in certain situations and end up causing terrible destruction. Christians today, even the most biblical inerrant 
this of them obviously no longer obey this biblical command to not suffer a witch to live. I got to wondering about this too, and of course, through the wonders and, and uh, excitement of the internet, I was able to go into a Christian chat room, and I just threw this out, you know, hey, how come we're not executing witches anymore? <laughs> it was amazing the answers I got, you know, because the Christian Reconstructionists, of course, they, they really say if an unrepentant homosexual should be executed, but you now I got responses like, well, it's against the law to kill witches. <laughs> Clear that when 
they were not performing before the uh, judges, the afflicted were perfectly fine. And that's not how ergotism works. Ergot toxicity also does not explain how, at times in the examination of the accused, the afflicted would demonstrate that pins, real, not spectral pins, had been stuck into them. Oh, look, they stuck a pin in me. You know, you sneak in, I mean, who couldn't do that? You know, you think of Yuri Geller or people like that. Uh, of course, pins were never stuck into their eyes or other vital body parts. As Bernard Rosenthal observed in his 1993 Salem story, um, and that's a very good book, I brought my copy with me back there, numerous other instances in which the quote unquote afflicted girls had to be knowingly cooperating in order to perpetrate the fraud. I thought maybe it did have a slide like this. Well, I meant to have a slide with the quote, but anyway, I'll just read it to you. He says, Anne and Abigail Williams testified that they were together when they saw the apparitions of Mary Easton, who was one of the accused who would ultimately be hanged, who told them she was afflicting another accuser, Mercy Lewis. Now, a private hallucination resulting from hysteria might be plausible, a shared one less so, although admittedly not inconceivable. But when two people produce pins as evidence and blame the same specter as Anne and Abigail Williams did on May 10th, at the examination of George Jacobs Sr., it is hard not to suspect full and rational knowledge of what is happening. And then there was a matter of four witnesses hearing Mercy Lewis say this happened in March of 1692, well before the first hanging in June. So this Mercy Lewis said that she did it for sport. They must have some sport. Four people heard her say that, but nothing ever came of it. In fact, anyone who openly doubted or criticized the afflicted uh, as uh, events unfolded could expect probably to be the next accused of witchcraft. So we talk about hysteria. This is like reign of terror type of stuff. Uh, traditional events have been blamed on these few uh, hysterical, delusional, mischievous, or malevolent little girls influenced by stories of voodoo magic told them by Reverend Samuel Paris' slave woman, Tichuba. Tichuba was a, you all heard of Tichuba, right? That's legendary connection there. So Tichuba was a Native American, probably an Arawak, who had been brought from Barbados by the Reverend Samuel Harris. Um, but over the years, she's often been described as of African ancestry or mixed African Indian origin. There's no evidence she was anything other than uh, an American Indian Arawak. It's been suggested that the episode thereby took on some flavor, a peculiar reenactment of the Genesis Fall of Man story. So Tichuba, the strange other, as well as a woman, playing the role of the evil serpent and the kind of dark Eve all rolled into one, enticing the innocent children and the whole New England city on a hill, the perfect, you know, theocracy of God into sin. Tichuba confessed to being a witch, yes, after being beaten by her Christian slave master, Samuel Paris. And Tichuba, it turns out, had a slave husband, also owned by the Reverend Paris. John Indian, as he was called, joined in the antics of the afflicted girls at the legal proceedings examining those accused of witchcraft. And by the way, there was never any evidence that Tichuba told voodoo stories. And this was just made up by somebody. He said, well, she's from Barbados. Maybe this happened. The next thing you know, we'll be back. I, I heard that she had cracked an egg into a jar. Yeah. Two girls looked into it and said they saw the same from that point forward. Yes. Yeah. And uh, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, you know, young girls would know about these things and would just do it without any urging from Tichuba. And then the witch cake episode. Anybody remember the witch cake? Witch cake is when you take some rye flour and you mix it with the afflicted girl's pee. <laughs> and you cook it and they, you feed it to the dog and whoever the afflicting witch is supposed to cry out, oh, that's hurting me. And some crazy thing about how when, I be, when you bewitch somebody, you know, some magic particles get into the person and uh, then they come out in your pee and you make this cake and you give it to the dog and oh, that hurts me. <laughs> and that was also the basis of the touch test, right? So, you know, if I put a bunch of bad magic mojo in you and then I and you're, you know, riding around and I'm forced to touch you, then it all comes back to me and then you're fine. So that's how the, you know, the, the touch test. So in addition to what actually happened in 1692, there's a whole tradition and a kind of folklore, not to mention unintentional as well as intentional fictions that have become attached to it. Uh, an example of last is Arthur Miller's 1952 play, The Crucible. And now that's uh, the way it's taught in school now to the, to the kids is that this is an accurate portrayal. Here's what happened with the Salem witchcraft episode when in fact it was written as an allegory of the McCarthy Red Scare era in 1952 when, when that was happening. Of course. 
The two films based on Miller's play are also examples of entertainment. We all know Hollywood changes things to make a better story, not serious attempts to represent history. Even as late as the 1970s and 1980s, scholars have been finding that various people involved in the Salem witchcraft trials in 1692 had been misidentified by their scholarly predecessors. So for example, there was a Sarah Bishop and there was a Bridget Bishop. These two women were confused by two of the accusers way back in 1692, who probably didn't know either one of them. Uh, but that confusion was picked up and perpetuated by historians. In fact, Bridget Bishop lived in Salem town and was probably 60 years old. And, uh, but she did like to wear some unpuritanly uh, garb. She liked to wear a red bodice, you know, sort of a little red vesty type thing. But then there was this other uh, bishop, Sarah Bishop, and of course they married to different guys too, uh, who, who lived in Salem Village. And it was said that she, quote, did entertain people in her house at unreasonable hours of the night. Meanwhile, her husband had uh, gotten into some trouble with the law about illegally selling some liquor. So somehow all these things got rolled into one person, Bridget Bishop, and she became this buxom, flashy dressing keeper of an illegal tavern. <laughs> <laughs> one thing that has remained clear, indisputably, is the importance of spectral evidence, as they said. In addition, a whole lot of additional spectral evidence was recalled by witnesses as having happened as much as 14 or more years previously. Can you imagine they bring in a 40-some-year-old guy who says, you know, 14 years ago, I woke up, there was this bright light, and Bridget Bishop was like laying on my chest and I couldn't breathe. You know, that's like, you know, the incubus and the succubus and, you know, spectral evidence recalled. And that this was taken seriously by the judges. And then, of course, the whole uh, implausible pin stuck in the afflicted sort of evidence. And this is what drove the convictions and hangings. Amazingly, considering the great power exercised by the devil in the courtroom in 1692, not once did the witches ever stick a pin into one of the judges. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, those accused began to appreciate that the old rules that you brought in, you're the next to be examined for being a witch, and you're realizing the old rule is no longer applicable, that if you steadfastly deny the charges, you may get acquitted, uh, while confession will probably get you hung. The new rules was clearly that confession and naming other witches, uh, joining the accusers in effect, and some did complete with the antics of, oh, the specters are attacking me. Uh, that happened. That was the key to survival. So obviously what was going to happen? Every conviction and hanging as the episode wore on only reinforced the scary idea that the community was under attack by this massive conspiracy against the community led by the devil and his minions. Here's the people that were killed. And you see that June 10th, Bridget Bishop is the first. That five more hung on July 19th. I should say hang, but that's the, uh, the terminology. August 19th, uh, what is that? One, two, three, four, five more hang at Giles Corey's press today. By the way, uh, George Burroughs was a former minister of Salem Village. And he, re he recited the, the Lord's Prayer on the scaffold perfectly, which no witch was supposed to be able to do. Uh, one of the things alleged against him is superhuman feats of strength. What do you think he did? He lift up a whole mountain or something? No, he, he put his finger in a musket and was able to lift things. That was part of the evidence against him. Somebody said he did that. Um, September 22nd, one, two, three, four, this, this, well, there were eight people hanged on, on that occasion. Five people also died in prison. And the prison conditions were terrible. And they wouldn't even let you out once the authorities said you could get out unless you paid the cost of your imprisonment. By October, by October so by this time, in 1692, 150 people were in prison. 200 more have been accused. The judges, and especially the chief judge, William Stoughton, oh, he's a piece of work. Um, I, I need to do more reading on him, too. Appeared to be committed to rooting out once and for all all the witchcraft that they could find. So given these things, of course, matters were going to spin out of control. How could it possibly end, given these, uh, this kind of an approach? Certainly, the judges were not about to admit their mistakes or make an end of it, although Nathaniel Saltonstall had uh, resigned in uh, June saying that he didn't think Bridget Bishop had done anything other than, you know, dress unseemly and make, a, make herself obnoxious. You know, weaken the stocks would have been fine, but instead they had to kill her. But here was a situation, and, you know, really something had to be done. Something rational had to be done, and finally it was. On October 12th of 1692, that's the date of the letter, Governor William Phipps wrote the Privy Council of William and Mary, 
dissembling a little bit on you know what he knew and when he knew it because he kind of wanted to pretend like oh I just found out about this uh, he knew he was there a little bit more than what he let on but he said that uh, and he had been away during some of the time because of the ongoing hostilities that uh, he was fighting the Indians and stuff but he wrote on this date on October 12 that he finally understood what danger some of their innocent subjects might be exposed to if the evidence of the afflicted persons only did prevail either to the committing or trying any of them. I did before my, any application was made unto me. It's all my idea, folks. Uh, put a stop to the proceedings of the court, and they are now stopped. No more people were killed after that. In January, the courts uh, resumed. Uh, I think there were a couple more convictions, uh, which uh, Pips immediately commuted uh, sentences and, and uh, had them uh, pardoned. At which point, uh, Stoke, remember I mentioned him a minute ago, he said, fine, I'm out of here, you're, you're not doing the right thing. I think it was May before finally things get, got completely wrapped up, but nobody else was killed. Spectral evidence was specifically said to be not regarded. And this is the basis of Free Thought Day, October 12th. It commemorates this important historic instance of the recognition of the necessity that acceptable evidence, particularly that used in things like legal proceedings, things that potentially affect anyone and everyone, that such evidence be objective, publicly demonstrable, and verifiable. As the article in today's bulletin suggests, this is almost certainly a step in the realization of the importance of state church separation. In fact, during the witchcraft craze, many people, I've not looked into the number and identities exactly, but they fled to places like Rhode Island, right, which was set up by Roger Williams, to be a bastion of religious freedom at the time. So that's, that was another way you could save your life. Get out of there. Coincidentally, October 12th is the day in 1492 when Columbus, quote unquote, discovered the New World. And with the deliberate bringing to an end of the Salem witchcraft trials on or about the same date in 1692, a small but important step had been taken towards the New World we now inhabit. For despite all the irrational nonsense we see continually around us, especially when it comes to matters of religion, we do live in a new world in which the sine qua non of truth is objective and verifiable truth. This kind of truth is not the only kind of truth. Of course, uh, beauty, for example, is still to a great degree in the proverbial eye of the beholder. But truth in the law, truth in the marketplace, certainly truth in medicine, which I deal in every day, and so many other areas of modern life is generally taken to be the kind of truth that does not amount to spectral evidence. It's objective, it's verifiable, it's demonstrable, it's something that we can perceive with our senses or build machines to perceive for us. And science has come to be the way in which we keep from fooling even ourselves so that more and more we can apply an ethical rule that supplements that of the golden rule. We all know the golden rule, great things and all. But this additional rule was formulated by the 19th century British mathematician William Kingdon Clifford, that we mentioned it before, sometimes referred to as Clifford's Cradle. So here's what you have to have in addition to the golden rule. But it's wrong, always, everywhere, for anyone to believe anything upon insufficient evidence. So that is how, in 1692, reason defeated unreason. Not once and for all, of course, much less forevermore. Uh, it's not a fairy tale after all. This is more like a comic book existence, or uh, maybe horror movies, which is also uh, appropriate for Halloween in October, you know, where the villain keeps coming back, you got screaming who, screaming you know, uh, Jason, whatever these different things are, they keep coming back again and again. But this is how it happens, and we should all do our part as best we can, wherever and whenever we can, against unreason. So please think about it. And that is kind of it for today. Uh, I think we're doing really good on time. How about comment? Yes, Paul. Oh. Uh. Yeah, I'll pass a little bit, but it's good. Too, that a, a large percentage of those, those witches were um, wealthy, uh, single, but will, no, no heirs, in other words. Like, it, like it really varied. Uh, the very first people accused were, like, Titulus was slave, and uh, Sarah Osborne and Sarah Good were, like, poor and old. Um, but towards the end of the thing, yeah, I mean, people would uh, quite a bit. I, mean, I did come across somewhere even a uh, statement that. Uh, Governor Phipps' wife was accused. And Governor Phipps might have been a little susceptible itself because he got his wealth and power from treasure hunting. And that was seen as kind of a, how do you find treasure without the devil helping him? Divination. Yeah, divination, that kind of thing. I'm sorry. But. Uh, I read up about witchcraft a long time ago just out of curiosity. And I found interesting was before we had hospitals and obstetricians and, and medicine, that's okay. Um, 
people that were good with herbs, like natural supplements and uh, ailments and so forth, you know, were targeted as witches and were midwives. So if the baby, if the baby's cord was wrapped and it was nobody's fault, but she delivered and killed the baby, then she was immediately identified as a witch and executed. Um, it's, it's rather sad, I think, that it's primarily women through centuries that were targeted. It was never a question of, well, this man was inflected by the devil. It was never men. It was always women that were inflected by the devil in targeting. Kind of so amazing. Yes. How we treat ourselves. This is a tremendously rich subject. Um, and of course, another thing is that uh, people who have a familiar spirit, what does that mean? You talk to yourself. Huh? You're a little odd. Um, also, schizophrenics, you know, we hear voices. Uh, this was written about by a guy named Julian James, who wrote this very interesting book, a long, long title called The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind.